And the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And it has dawned, hasn't it? You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as the people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when the divine the plunder. For the day of Midian defeat, you, you shattered the yoke and the burdens and bar across the shoulders and the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be a destined for burning the fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne, and over his kingdom establish and upholding with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. And we just say thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much that you have established your kingdom here on this earth. And we thank you for the Christ child. And we have anticipated your arrival um, throughout this Advent season that we have been preparing our hearts for, for worshiping the Christ child. And let us, not, let us not lose sight of who you are and what this moment is about. And we worship you, King of kings and Lord of lords. In Christ's name we pray, amen. stars are brightly shining it is the night of the dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth Rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, no. By his cradle I'll stand So led by light of a star Sweetly gleaming Here came the wise men From Orient land The king of kings lay us in lowly manger in all our trials born to be our friend fall on your knees oh hear the angel voices oh no divine oh night when Christ was born oh night divine oh night oh night divine fall on your knees 
places Oh, night divine Oh, night when Christ was born Oh, night Oh, holy night Oh, I broke my headset, and I'm sad about that. It's kind of my cool factor. <laughs> it's the only thing on Sunday morning that makes me cool, okay, is that I have a headset. Uh, but uh, I, I, I tested it, the mic still works, it just is like going to be just sitting there dangling like a, like a fishing lure or something like that, and I'm just going to be trying to grab at it all, all morning long. Uh, there's a few things that uh, I'd like to continue to, to ask you to pray about this Christmas morning. Uh, Darcy Campo, she's my next door neighbor. Uh, she's she's uh, uh, she's been on a kidney transplant list for a long time. She goes uh, through dialysis every single evening. She's got a bacterial infection that is fighting against her body, and I'm going to ask you to, to be praying for Darcy. Um, uh, I believe that God uh, can minister to Darcy, um, and God uh, has has increased my faith about prayer. Uh, every single night, we are, uh, we're gathering around as a family, and we're praying intentionally for people with, with ever-increasing faith because we're reminded Christ tells us that we have not because we have asked not. And so, uh, don't just think that God's going to hear your prayer in your heart. I ask you to be intentional about praying that because I believe that God unleashes something from heaven whenever we ask it. Amen? Um, we continue to pray for Miss Elaine. She found out she got a tear in her, in her uh, shoulder, a right shoulder there. And uh, Monty uh, continues to have struggles with his hand. And, uh, and we know that he needs to drive. We know that he needs to, to get around and... and, uh, and Elaine can't slow him down as much as she wants uh, him to. Are there other prayer requests? Yes. Lisa. Lisa. Because we are a church that believes in prayer, and I got to share a very key story with him. Yep. And uh, he's counting on us to pray for us. Let's be lifting up Lisa Vaughn and be praying for the Wickware family as uh, uh, they lost Mike Wickware. Um, uh, we lost Mike Wickware. I went and visited him in the hospital, I believe, Tuesday night. Um, and prayed for him and and he got well well enough to leave the hospital and go into the nursing home and the next day he passed away and so be uh, praying for that family uh, as well let's pray together our heavenly father we thank you so much for the christ child that that offers love that offers light into dark situations lord we lift up uh, lisa vaughn to you lord we because we know that you are the source of all healing and we know we uh, pray to the great physician and we pray the prayer of faith that she can be healed lord and it's my prayer that you minister to her it's my prayer that you minister to uh, uh to my next door neighbor as well darcy I pray that uh, you minister through her as only that you can uh, and pray that your will would be done and we ask for healing, Lord. And so uh, we're asking for it, Lord. We're asking it in a, intentionally uh, for healing. Um, God, we, uh, we look to you for sources of strength for our elders and those that have uh, gone before us and the great saints uh, that have, uh, have paved the way for us um, and uh, have established 
and have rooted themselves in your word. And so we just ask that uh, you continue to be faithful to Elaine and Monty as well. Uh, for this morning in which that we gather together, I, I pray as uh, your hearers hear your word, I pray that it, is a, that it increases our faith and it reminds us of who you are and that who we are. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Okay, so I've got 20 minutes here. Um, ask 20 minutes of your undivided attention. And for some of you, you might be saying, you can't handle my und undivided attention. Uh, so that's why I don't give it to you. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's a, a few months ago, uh, this is Isaac's first Christmas. And so, uh, not yet, CJ, not yet. Okay? Come back there. I'll tell you when, okay? Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I, this is Isaac's first Christmas, and I'm, I'm thinking about four and a half months ago, whenever many of you heard the story of us being in uh, the salon, getting our hair done, the day that, that uh, Cassandra's water broke, you know, and just all the, the things that were going through our mind, thinking that we had enough time for everything. You know, we'd had enough time to get her hair done that day. Uh, but at the same time, you know, whenever she comes in, she says, uh, Kaysen, I think my water broke. All these types of things just kind of start reeling through my mind of like, okay, what, how are we going to do this? You know, how are we going to get to Oklahoma City? How are we going to get to the hospital and stuff like that? And she's just got this overwhelming sense of calmness about her. But I get to thinking, you know, who is it that are going to watch our, others boy, our other boys and... I'm just kind of thinking just the responsibility that a parent has. Um, then I get to thinking about the vehicle that we're driving to go to the hospital in because I've heard, I've heard stories of things that pregnancies are, or uh, uh, labors that happen so quickly and just thinking what in the world what would happen if the baby comes in our Explorer? Because I know of some things that have happened in the Explorer. I know a lot of sneezes from the back seat. I know a lot of uh, kids, uh, my own, that have thrown up in there, that have chewed some stuff up and probably spit them somewhere. I'm just thinking, uh, this is not a sterile environment. You know, and, and for somebody that is not in the medical profession, for me to be worried about that, the person that should be worried about it is the nurse that is in labor at the, this particular time. And just thinking, this is not a sterile environment. And I'm trying to relate this Christmas season back to that last uh, encounter that I had w with a wife being in labor. And just trying to think of the Christ child that was born in a manger. That probably that the sterile environment was not their concern. <laughs> Uh, they probably couldn't be concerned. But I'm just thinking about our, our worries about those particular things. And then how vulnerable a baby child is. See, I, um, the last two days, Isaac has been running a fever and just thinking, you know, we've got to take care of this. I've, I've, I've gotten every boiling pot, filled them up with water and started boiling water. To, and I've turned on the hot shower, you know, to make sure that there's humidity in, in the household. And just thinking about how I think how fragile a child is. I'm just trying to relate to this Christ child that is born in a manger. I think we all try to do that. I think we all try to relate to the Christ child. Um, okay, CJ, I, I've got a, a couple of pictures that I want to show you guys, okay? Um, um, this first picture, uh, I think this is a very sweet picture, right? Uh, you can kind of tell it's like a Norman Rockwell type of thing, very staged. Um, I don't know if you could ever get a more perfect picture, but this child, I would say, you know, three, four, five years old, you know, um, we get to a different picture. We have kind of another cute picture. Getting a little younger in age, you know, we're thinking about six months to maybe a year old uh, with that and just uh, in awe of the white beard. And then we get to another picture. <laughs> You know, I, I don't, I can just imagine the, the child being okay at the very first whenever he sits on Santa's lap and then he gets this 
face on him. And, and chaos is about to break loose. You can kind of see it. It's, you're on the edge of your seat. It's about to happen. You know? And so this, this picture, this snapshot gets this. Okay, and we see the chaos beginning to happen in this picture, and you can kind of see the look on Santa's face as it's kind of like, uh, what, are you, what am I going to do with this child? The next picture, CJ. <laughs> I love this one. Uh, we know this is the real Santa, right? Because, I mean, he's got the real beard and everything. It's not coming off as much as that child wants that beard to come off. Uh, the next picture. Oh my, I love Santa's look on his face there. And the last picture that I want to show you is this, and I love Santa's reaction with this one too. You know how I interpret all those scenarios, all those pictures? You want to know how I would interpret all those pictures? Different reaction to the same event. That's how I'd interpret all those pictures. Different reactions to the same event. And I want to, to, to kind of read you a passage of Scripture this morning found in Matthew chapter 2. And I kind of want you just to, to re remind you of, of... I don't want that. <laughs> you just push clear up there at the top left. Thank you. Matthew chapter 2. It says this... After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? I kind of want to pause right here and just say, Matthew does something completely different than the rest of the, the, the narratives of the birth story. He tells the birth story. He gives the genealogy. He tells about the announcement from the angelic type of, of figures. And then he skips ahead two years. Two years after Jesus is born. And so we think that sometimes that this story is kind of uh, jammed together as if that the Magi and, 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 um, and some of the other events that maybe were jammed together all in the same time period, maybe in a few days or a few months. But Matthew skips ahead and we believe that it's about two years. So, so Jesus is two years old at this point in time, okay? And so they, not, this is not in a stable. This is probably in a house somewhere. There, this is a toddler that is running around the house and stuff like this is, is the time of Jesus, okay? So they ask, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And we saw the star in the east, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people, the chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Christ to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet is written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will, be, will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out uh, from them the exact time the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find them, report them to me so that I may go and worship him. And we know that that was a bold-faced lie because later on uh, what had happened was that an angel had told the, the uh, um Joseph to take your family and get out of e get out of town, get to Egypt, and told the the Magi to kind of go to a different location. And then later, what happens is that Herod ends up going to that particular town and t and and taking every boy that was two years old and younger and killing them. He was had no intention on worshiping them. Um, it's kind of interesting here, this, the story of the Magi. We don't really know, um, particularly, we assume that there are three of them. Now, Carrie, I'm sorry, I'm going to ruin your We Three Kings from yesterday, uh, the, the song. And maybe if this is like your favorite song uh, about the whole nativity type of story. Uh, but we don't really know that there was three of them. We just assume because that there were three gifts in which that they gave him. Uh, anybody, uh, if you guys read ahead or was able to read with me, uh, what were the three gifts? 
Frankincense, myrrh, and gold. I heard all three of them, so good job. So we assume because there was three gifts that there had to be three people along with them. And we think that maybe that we, we get this Hollywood image as if that they were just traveling three uh, type of wise men on camels, um, but uh, more than likely that they were probably uh, people that were traveling on donkeys and um, whether that they were, it was one particular person or um, whether that there were five of them, uh, they were probably traveling with an entourage. Because the truth be told, this, uh, this group of, of wise men, and not necessarily kings, they were, they, the reason why that they probably called them three kings is because they were actually uh, advisors to the king, the spiritual leaders of their territory at the time. And they had, it's known to believe that they had a conglomeration. They studied a lot of different religions and a lot of different prophecies. And so it's almost as if that it was, it was in an entertainment type of value that whenever they studied the Jewish belief, uh, the Israel type of people, that they would be looking to the stars as astrologists to kind of line up of what the prophecies were, were going to say. And so here... It was their time that they said, okay, the Messiah is to be born at this particular time. So let's take this journey and let's go worship him. Let's go see what this is all about. Yeah, because I believe that these wise men took journeys all uh, their entire life to try to figure out, um, you know, not just to figure out, but just for their entertainment value to, to just kind of go and do the exploration type of thing. So the star had appeared in the sky and they followed it. And it was as if it kind of started here and, and, and kind of followed uh, this trajectory towards this town of Bethlehem and kind of rested upon there by the end of their journey. And so we believe that it not just took a few days, it took months. And so they had a bunch of these supplies and stuff like that. And so it rested upon Bethlehem. Um, and they said that they'd come to worship him. Um, we, we get to this point where another encounter um, with the same event was this king called King Herod. Uh, now, the Roman people have kind of taken over this territory. And what they have done is that they took a local person. They would say, okay, Steve, uh, you're kind of the local person over Watonga, so I want you to be king over this territory. He was a local person. It wasn't out of the ordinary uh, to, to take somebody that was local and call them ruler, even though that they weren't necessarily Roman, because King Herod was actually part Jew, part Hittite. But he was also good at playing the system, walking the fence. He was trying to appease the Roman government. And so he did that job so well that they gave them a title. They gave King Herod a title of nobody else. First of all, king. And they decreed that Herod would become and would be known as king of the Jews. They trusted him so much. They entrusted him with that name. And, and with that title, he became so obsessed with that title. He didn't want anybody else to have that title. So much to the fact that, that he thought that his wife was going to take over the throne. And so he had her killed. He was so obsessed with the title of king. He was so obsessed with his power that he had his mother-in-law killed because he thought that the mother-in-law was going to take over his throne. And like a good father does, right? He had three children, three boys for that matter. And he knew that one day that they were going to take over his throne, but he was so obsessed with it that he had his three boys even killed because he didn't want anybody else to have the title of king of the Jews except for him. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the emotion that came over this obsessed man whenever the Magi would come to him and say, we're looking for who? The king of the Jews. I believe it just kind of went all over him. <laughs> so much to the fact that he would deceive. So much to the fact that he would even kill all boys in the town. Two years of age and younger. Now I'm thinking, okay, now that's a different reaction to an event that I'm familiar with. 
So different to the reaction of, of the event that maybe, that maybe, just maybe, that we would have a similar reaction. Can I just make this statement to you? And uh, you can just take it for what it's worth. You can say, no, I don't agree with that, or yes, I do. But I can tell you this. This is what I believe. I believe that the most important decision that you will ever make in your life, the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, is what you do with the Christ child. That's the most important. You well, know, you say, okay, Kason, I've, I've listened to you preach for five and a half years now. And I, I know that you've said uh, there's some most important things that, that can happen in your life, right? Uh, uh, you've said that there's very important things. The very important thing is who you marry. You know, if you're going to marry somebody, that's an important thing. You know, make a wise choice about that because it's very important. But I'm telling you, there's a more important decision is what you do with the Christ child. There's another important decision, uh, who you choose to have be your friends and who you surround yourself and what type of voices that you listen to. Yes, that is very important, but not as important as what you'll do with the Christ child. So, so Herod has this reaction to what he will do with the Christ child. And it's not a very different, different reaction to what some of us do with a Christ child whenever he comes knocking on our doors. Sometimes we have this power type of thing in which that if he comes into my world, I'm going to have to relinquish some of the control that is in my life. I'm going to have to give it over to him. Now whenever Isaac was born in my life, I gave up a lot of my rights. I had to because I love him. I gave up my right to, <laughs> to sleep. I don't have that right anymore. Until he starts sleeping at night, I gave up that right. I found out today, uh, when Cassandra was at, and this might be too TMI, okay, but, so some of you just close your ears. I found out today, I gave up the right to use the restroom whenever I want to. You know? I can't even do that anymore. You know, you have to kind of plan your, your stuff around that. But that's kind of what the thing is, what Christ wants you to do is give up your rights. To Him. Now trust me, you can trust your life with this Christ child. It's not a heavy burden. You want to know what kind of uh, floors me a little bit about the story? Is that this guy that was not willing to relinquish his control or submit or bow his knee to this Christ child, the one that would be called King of the Jews, it was his people that he called for advice. He called the chief priests and the rulers of, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the studiers of the law. And he said, where will this Christ child be? And it was as if that these people was like, no big deal. Bethlehem. These people that were God followers that, that King Herod had summoned. And they said, where will this Christ child be born? And they said, in Bethlehem. I mean, don't you kind of get that from them? As if that there was no reaction at all. There's King Herod that was irate and he was willing to do anything to eliminate him from the, their life and to the fact of the, even the people that would be considered to be studiers of the word and, and doers of the law, that they would know the prophecy and they would even admit Christ's child will be born in Bethlehem. Oh well. As if they had no reaction at all. And I know that the, that reaction, remember I said the most important decision that you'll ever make in your life is what you will do with the Christ child, is no different than some of our reactions that we have had to the Christ child, like the teachers of the law, that would say, he's coming into my life. I'm, maybe, it, maybe it's stirring up my comfort zone. Maybe I'm going to have to do something. Or maybe whenever the Christ child comes knocking at our doors that we would just kind of shrug our, our shoulders and say, oh well, like that's going to happen again <laughs> because he always does, right? It kind of floors me a little bit. And I think that we in this room can kind of relate with that as well. That maybe that the Christ child has come to us. Maybe the Savior of the world has come to us 
and say, what are you going to do about this? And we say, mm, I'm not going to get excited about it. <laughs> these wise men, these outsiders, these people that were not even chosen people are the ones that would come to worship Him. They've experienced something that a lot of these other people didn't experience. They chose to follow the prophecy. They chose to, in, in, in ancient times, what they believed is that if something, if something mysterious or, or miraculous was happening in the sky, it meant that something miraculous had happened on earth. It reminds me of something was told later on in Matthew that what you bind here on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever that you loose here on this earth, you will loose in heaven. Because here is just the opposite of that. What they also believed, if then whenever something miraculous was happening here on this earth, it means that it would be reflected in the sky. I'm reminded of... Steve Rother's uncle, whenever they're, they're kind of debating about this sainthood, that after that they have this particular debate of whether or not that he would become a saint, that they would stop and that they would look for a miracle. It's not too far off of what they were happening here, is that if something miraculous happened here, that they would look to the sky. I kind of have been looking up a little bit more. I kind of have been looking up because the, the truth of the matter is, is that I've, I've realized that I've looked down a lot. I've looked down at a particular light in my life. And it's normally an artificial light. And I kind of have been noticing some stars a little bit lately because I just, I mean, ba basically this last week I've been looking up because I've been looking for, I wonder what that star looked like. And all the significance that that brought to these wise men. I mean, I don't, know, I don't believe that these wise men were the same. Because everything that the prophecy that they had followed, they'd followed what was written and they followed what was above, they, and they ended up discovering something so amazing. They ended up discovering that the prophecies in Micah and Isaiah all come fruition. I don't know about you, um, but can you imagine, just imagine with me, you having a two-year-old kid, two-year-old toddler, and one day you get the knock at the door, and there are these this entourage of people, and they're laying gifts at your son's feet. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Not very, not very inexpensive stuff. Actually, very expensive stuff. And you're sitting there and you're just wondering and in awe of this happening because you're burying the Christ child. And here he is, two years old. And all these types of things that are solidifying and are giving more weight to this is truly the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the most important question that I believe that we have to deal with today is what is your reaction? What is your, what are you going to do with this Christ child? I believe that we all have different reactions to the same event. You've chosen to be here on a Sunday morning, 2016, um, many, many thousands of years ago that this has happened. And we still wrestle with this question. What are we going to do with this Christ child? Today, we have an opportunity to respond in the form of what the Christ child did for us. He didn't stay in divine diapers his entire life. That he, cha he, he traded his diapers in for a cross. Because that's the way that God had the plan of salvation for you and I. To trade in diapers for a cross. What are we going to do with it? I believe that's an important, important question to ask whenever we take the elements. Today we're going to have a few, uh, we're going to have two stations 
two stations of, of, uh, of communion. And we're going to ask you to, you can come and you can uh, receive the elements as a family. Um, and that's kind of how we're going to close our time. Um, and CJ, if you don't mind playing that, uh, that last slide uh, as, as we kind of disperse those elements.